This is a system of letter forms that I designed for Barbara's class um, that is based on crop circles. And um, this, you know, as a student of Cooper Union and particularly Barbara's class, I really learned so much about um, that letter forms don't come that way. They just don't appear that way. You get to control all of, all of the details of it. And this was one of the fun kind of um, assignments that we did. And this is the brochure for it. The font was called Terrestrial. And 1998 called and wants its design gimmicks back. Like the, the shapes, everything. I pulled this out of my portfolio and I was like, wow, this is quite a flashback. Um, and then also in Barbara's class, I did things like this. And this is my 22-year-old self exploring experimental typography. And I will say that um, this is going to be the last thing you see on the screen that has actually been made on a computer, at least by me. I'm not going to show you my work. We're going to talk about something a little bit more personal and open-ended. And you've sat through an entire day of speakers. I'm your TGIF talk now, so um, let's get the show on the road. So we're going to talk about something that's much more personal to all of us, and that is handwriting. And Jonathan Heffler and I had nothing to do with the themes of our <laughs> talks matching. We actually didn't meet for the first time until last night. Um, but it seems that the curators of the conference had some ideas in mind about how they paired people's topics. So when I say, and actually, this is a sketchbook from 1998. You can see the crop circles taking shape on the upper left corner of the sketchbook. And when I say handwriting, I don't mean things like um, hand lettering and calligraphy, the things that we make that look beautiful and for show, um, or handwritten fonts, the ones that kind of are the manufactured version that is often so like gimmicky, um, uh, you know, I'm the, what I'm talking about is the real deal, the raw stuff. Um, so I'm curious, just by a show of hands, how many of you actually write notes on a piece of paper? Awesome. Okay, that's really great to hear. Um, I, you know, obviously handwriting has been kind of the topic of conversation culturally for a, a few years now. It's apparently going extinct. But I'm a firm believer that we as human beings still use writing as a process to kind of organize our thoughts and to make sense of the world. We, we process, we document, we think about things on a piece of paper. It's a conversation we have with ourselves. These are actually my notes for preparing this talk. It's about half the pile of notes, my whole, like, table and bed were covered with notes a few weeks ago when I was trying to put all of my ideas together. Um, so these days, handwriting is no longer a means of mass communication as it was up until the 1500s, nor is it used for business communication as it was until the invention of the typewriter in the 1860s, or is it really even an interpersonal communication tool because we don't write things to each other very much, or at least we don't see the way we write things to each other. So most often it's a tool of personal communication with ourselves. And with the exception of a few instances of handwriting that we encounter in random places on a daily basis, this is our, our encounter with handwriting is being able to see, you know, our own handwriting peeking over your coworker's sketchbook or whatever. And I, this is why I find handwriting fascinating. These are all the things that you've seen so far, just random things I pulled out. I like to write. I also have a very thorough cross-out method. Um, it makes me feel like I got things done. So whenever I get a glimpse of the way that somebody writes, the uncensored stuff, the real stuff, not the stuff that they think anyone's ever really going to see, I feel like I'm looking at the inner wiring of their brain, like how they're thinking and their brain on paper. It's like the inner guts of their thought process. And for me, that reveals something not only about how they think, but also what their personal typography might be like and what they might be like. So um, here's just some examples of um, samples of handwriting I've pulled from friends and students and just examples of things that I think are so interesting because how somebody writes can offer be, often be more interesting than what they're writing. And again, this desire to kind of make sense of our world and process things and we do, a lot of us do this through writing. Um, and we have these personal systems that we create to make sense of the world around us. And speaking of personal systems, the inspiration for this talk actually came from this artifact. This is a record keeping system that my father uses and has used for the last 35 years of his life. He keeps an agenda in which he logs all the activities of his days. And so he can, it's like his own analog database of his life. And I look at this and I see, um, oh, actually, spoiler. Um, 
I look at this and I see it as a portrait of my father. I see it not only because of the things that it says and it's kind of like the details of his life and his, his day-to-day story, but I see his personality in the way that he writes these things. To me, this is, this is a portrait of him. And I've been obsessed with these books um, that he makes for quite some time. This is another um, piece that I made as a freshman here at Cooper a long time ago, where I scanned every spread of a single year's book and I sort of juxtaposed them um, on each other just to kind of have this sense of space and what a year of somebody's life and their activities might look like. And this was 1996, maybe. Um, so again, this is a long love. I've watched my father kind of create these, this system and fill it out for himself for a long time. So again, I find this fascinating not only because of how it functions for him, but you know whether or not you believe that, as some people say, handwriting is the tracks of the imagination on a piece of paper, there is information that comes through in the way that somebody writes. It's raw, it's messy, sometimes it's really kind of messed up. But again, I know my father and I see qualities of him um, when I look at this writing and I see he's an architect, retired now, but was an architect. He's meticulous with information. He loves statistics. He's kind of quiet. He's organized. He's um, kind. I don't know. There's things that I see here that I think are embodied in the way that he writes these, um, these books. And so for me also, this goes back to the root of typography, because whether it's prefabricated type or handwritten type, it just goes back to the same idea. The shapes of the letter forms that we read information through inform the reaction and the emotional resonance and the kind, of, the kind of context that we have for the information that we're reading. It's the same. It's our own personal human root of typography. Um, and so what, again, when I look at his um, writing, I see these certain qualities and I decided to um, play a little game with this. Um, again, because I find handwriting fonts somewhat problematic most of the time. Inkwell sounds fascinating and I can't wait to play with it, but they're sort of gimmicky and you just kind of throw handwriting on something and it's like, oh, it's human, it's personal, it's um, rustic. I mean, there's these adjectives that are used for it. But what I love about this is there's an inherent sense to this typography that could be the same as like an ideal sans or an FF Bauer. There's kind of a calculation in the way the letter forms are created that it just happens to be done by hand, but the inherent kind of qualities of this kind of purposeful intention, the detail-oriented kind of quality of it, just because it's done by hand, it, the personality of it to me is coming through in a very, very similar way. My mother's handwriting, on the other hand, and you can see kind of how 45 years of marriage, they probably rubbed off on each other a little bit, and they're kind of very meticulous handwriting, but it's more playful, it's warm, it's rounded, um, it's more emotive, it's, and this for me is who she is. She's much more kind of vivacious and bubbly, and um, so I see that in her handwriting. And I tried to pa pair the type with her. Um, I also feel like some serif, like a really round, bubbly serif would really do it justice as well. This is avant-garde. My brother, on the other hand, um, that's a really funny note, by the way, if you read it. I also feel like I'm revealing so much about my life by showing these examples. <laughs> but this is a note my brother left for me when we were all away with the family a year ago. And I look at his handwriting, and I also see his personality come through it. It's messier. It's rougher. He's the kind of person that doesn't really care as much as what people think of him. He, at least to me and my knowledge of him, he also has a fragility and a vulnerability that you'd be really hard-pressed to get at. But there's like a kind of a sensitivity and kind of a hesitation in the way he writes his letter forms, but yet they're kind of, he's a pit bull of a lawyer and like just doesn't care. He just writes these things. I also love the way he drew the heart, by the way, if anybody got to the bottom of it. It's the best. Um, so here's like some examples of typefaces I was looking at that could embody the same characteristics. Again, in a prefabricated typeface, not a hand-drawn font, I mean, not a hand-drawn um, piece. And so my love of handwriting goes kind of a long way back. And this theme of this talk kind of happened by accident when I looked at one of my dad's books and I haven't talked about this topic before and I kind of feel like it's the beginning of possibly a lifelong project. <laughs> but this is a book that I have had since I was four years old in which I have samples of the handwriting and it's not samples, they weren't created to be samples. There was a tradition when I was growing up in Poland that kids had these books, they were called memory books and you would have friends and family and classmates and people you met write something down for you in a book. 
And so I literally have this book that I've had, you know, for many, many decades, for several decades, um, that contains the handwriting samples of people that I was close with. The left side is my grandfather. The right side is my first grade teacher. This is my aunt. Snoopy comes back again. There's recurring themes that are about to happen in a lot of these um, uh, slides. But it's this, uh, Aristotle has this amazing quote that letters were invented so we could converse with the absent. And the ancient Greeks, when... Um, when writing, when the writing system was invented, had a real kind of concern that it was going to make us all dumber, that we weren't going to be thinking as deeply, and that we would forget things by writing them down, and that um, there's this really great quote by Walter Ong that sustained thought in oral culture is tied to communication, and to think deeply and complexly requires one to talk to somebody. And when you start to write things down, you're just talking to yourself. Um, but there's beauty and benefit in that because I now have these examples of these people that have crossed paths with me, um, a typographic artifact of them. Right hand side with the little duck is a boy I had a crush on in first grade. Left hand side on this spread is a boy I had a crush on me. So all these like lovely stories kind of are captured in the way these people wrote their notes in this little book. Um, this is the handwriting of my aunt um, who also wrote this message in that same little book. And eight years ago when we were um, designing a website for my studio, Kiss Me on Polish, we decided to use this handwriting for the website. And we decided not to try and fake it. We literally photoshopped from her handwriting and another sample that she handwrote for me, all the words we needed, like actual photographic rendition. So they were kind of collaged together, but like there was no way that a font I felt could kind of articulate this thing. Um, and I love this type, this also, this type is sort of regimented, it's structured, it's also decorative, it's ornamental. And, you know, there, there's a point at, at which our own handwriting just sort of becomes automatic, right? Like it doesn't, it's a habit, it's a pattern, it's not something that we think about. But there are definitely points in our lives where we sort of, writing is a conscious decision. And I remember this, like it's a way that we define ourselves. And I remember this process really well as a child, learning how to write and learning how to like form my letter forms and what that would say about me. So again, I'm, I'm pulling out all the stops. <laughs> this is uh, my first grade notebook where I first learned how to make shapes. And my friend of mine said, oh, you learned how to draw boobs. Um, where, where I first learned how to make shapes that would then lead me to learn how to write. Um, and so I, this is, you know, I just, I love this artifact that I have. Like, these are how I learned how to shape my letter forms. And again, the penmanship here is Polish, so it's very different than the penmanship in other cultures and other regions of the world. But the idea of a child at age seven learning how to form their letter forms is just fascinating to look at. Um, this is a few couple of years later when I was maybe nine and I was learning English. And so you can see the handwriting here has evolved to be a little bit less shaky, a little bit more confident. I'm starting to try and figure out what my own sort of like shapes are, but still really following convention. And it was amazing to look at this single book and just see how the handwriting even in just this one book for one year of my life at that age evolves um, and how it's changed. This is from 1988, and you can really start to see how I'm experimenting with the descenders on the J's and the Y's, like trying to be cool and interesting and like maybe do something different. Um, so like the unsure learning self is trying to figure out like what will make it sort of a little bit more unique. Um, and then this is the same year actually, maybe a year later. This is, you can see, this is when I was already living in the States. I feel like the American style of penmanship is starting to come through, but again, like kind of, you know, schizophrenic, like different styles in every letter. Um, this is from a journal from, uh, I don't know, five or six years later. And, oh, what's interesting, well, this is, <laughs> it's not a journal, actually, it's a letter I'm trying to break up with a boy, I think. Um, but one of the things that I remember so vividly is this idea that I wanted my G's to be really unique. Like, I didn't want the single story open tail G on the left. I really wanted to learn how to write naturally this double story loop tail G. And I succeeded, but it was like a thing that I was trying to make sure that I was a person whose handwriting had that G. And I don't know what that meant to me, but it was important, and I still, to this day, write like that. Um, this is from my first year at Cooper, my handwriting evolving. This is maybe 2002. This is what I write like now. Total crap. <laughs> 
Um, but this is, again, another sketch from this talk. And you can just see, like, this is a hurried kind of exploration of an idea. And it's so fascinating for me to have gone through all this and just see, I'm seeing another person. Like, I go back in time and see myself, and I'm having this kind of dialogue with myself. Um, so what I found interesting in kind of thinking about this topic is that um, in the 1800s, Michon was the original kind of inventor of graphology, which is the study of handwriting and what it means about your personality traits. Um, and so this is a beautiful quote of his. But what I found so interesting is that this is a really um, kind of a relatively new idea that handwriting is any kind of depiction of who you are and your personality and this analysis is a really relatively new phenomenon. Um, if you look at the history of writing, um, and it's sort of like 5,000 year old trajectory, um, the first 3,000 of those years were certainly not about being an individual and about personal expression or any kind. In fact, you could say that the first 4,500 years up until um, the kind of the rise of penmanship um, that it's only really with the invention of the typewriter in the 1800s that we started to associate our expression of the self with the way that we wrote. Um, and that's when it became sort of something unique and personal and kind of conflated with who you are as a person. Um, so I'm just gonna run through really quickly like some of the history that I found because I just geeked out over this stuff. And a lot of the stuff I felt like I knew, but like it was fascinating to look at it from this bent. Cuneiform, the original um, writing system, was definitely not personal. It was all record keeping. Like there was nothing expressive about it. Um, hieroglyphics were the same way and they were highly elitist at a time when culture was very, very, access to literacy was very, very low. Um, then you look at sort of like the Roman um, capitals movement, the capitalis movement, and the quadrata, and based on Roman hand, on writing, this was very systematized and kind of supported as a you know authoritative system. There was not really much flexibility there. Um, this is another example of capitalis. Um, the Capitalis Rustica, which came around um, in the first half, like uh, between 0 and 800 AD, it's a tighter, more efficient use of space, and the Christian church eventually decided that it looked heathen, so they um, developed their own script in the 6th century. So this is where we start to kind of see the significance of the style of writing, but on a kind of state level, not a personal level. Um, so there, you know, with the kind of, in the Middle Ages and antiquity, states started to really brand themselves, states and regions and countries started to brand themselves through the look of their letters. So um, Anshil in the 68th century is still considered very Christian looking. This mirrored the churches kind of spread through Europe and became a symbol of consolidation and designed to distinguish Christianity from Rome. Um, this is a half Anshil example. Um, then this explosion of these Baroque, um, ex this Baroque explosion of geographically specific scripts where each region of Europe had this own way of writing and that's kind of how, again, how they branded themselves. This is um, in, from France from the seventh um, or eighth century. This is Spanish, six to ninth century, Italian, same period. So there's nuances in the way these scripts are written that make it very clear where they came from and people from different areas, not only could they not understand the language, but they actually, the way the letters were written, couldn't really even try and read it. This is Ireland, Germany, Valerian, ha, <laughs> Game of Thrones fans, fake, sorry. Um, and Dutch, <clears throat> this is actually found online for the Valerian handwriting from Game of Thrones, anyway. Um, so then in uh, following the rule of Charlemagne, the first um, Holy Roman Empire emperor, um, this Carolinian minuscule became the authoritative script in Europe. And it was really revered for its legibility, practicality. It's kind of a throwback to the Roman typefaces, but it really became like the standard. They had had enough of all these kind of individual styles across Europe and it became the kind of standard type, type treatment. And then comes black letter and Gothic um, in the 12th century. And it, was evol it evolved actually as a, a, a variation of Carolinian and it compresses the letters more tightly. It's not as legible. And it was ultimately seen as barbarous and ugly um, as far as handwriting goes. And then humanist in the 15th century. And this is kind of, it lets air into handwriting. It makes it accessible, more classical, human, again, just its name. 
says that. And just the idea that like this was the first time that we're really seeing this debate as to whether the quality of hand, one's handwriting is the same thing as one's ability to express ourselves. Um, because the Gothic was seen as barbarous and less literate in some ways, so we're seeing this kind of debate between like what it means with the way you express yourself. So then we're gonna skip ahead a few hundred years to the 1800s and Spencer, Platt Spencer, who sort of became the, the leader of the golden age of American penmanship. And he, he no longer really um, sort of, he perpetuated this idea that it wasn't about your status, but it like your handwriting made you a better human being. Like it was this idea of moralism, that your a good Spencerier, Spencerian hand was an indicator that you were like a good Christian. Um, and his imagery is really based on nature. He was a believer in nature. He felt that writing was a kind of an, a re reverie of some kind. And so you see the forms of the, the typefaces were really, the, the handwriting style is really kind of inspired by the beauty in nature, clouds and branches and ovals from, came from stone. And so it was just really kind of this very moralistic way of approaching handwriting. And it was really kind of a regimented system that was accepted all across America. Um, and this is a beautiful quote that comes from one of his books. I think he wrote a poem about what handwriting should be like. Anyway. Um, and again, it wasn't just about learning one's letters. It was about becoming a better person. And by disciplining your hands, you could discipline your mind. Okay, also, fun fact, his handwriting, or his handwriting style was the inspiration for Coca-Cola's logo as well as Ford. Okay, then in the um, late 1800s came the Palmer Method, who declared that Spencerian was too feminine and too ornamental, and this was sort of the rise of industrialism and capitalism, and we needed something much more efficient, emphasizing simplicity and speed, and so it was kind of much a more bureaucratic style, and this is the method that a lot of our kind of grandparents learned uh, in the United States. I don't have American grandparents, but I mean our, as like those that, that, of you that might. And so Spencerian was pretty, but the Palmer method was considered live and usable and legible and scalable. So these are some examples. These are some actual drills that people were doing to like learn how to write this method. Um, it was also the standard for about 100 years in American schools. I just love this picture. This just looks like fun, doesn't it? <coughs> um, and again, and there's these beautiful, there's archives. I mean, I unearthed a wealth of things. There's archives of old documents online, and there's these, like, kind of deeds and bills and invoices written in this Palmarian hand that is just so beautiful um, and very kind of capitalistic. Okay, so... Um, Let's go back. Okay, I'm watching for the time. Okay, so Rosemary Sassoon is another kind of academic who's still alive who believes in the kind of the merits of graphology. So obviously this idea of analyzing people's handwriting for their inherent personal qualities is sort of a skeptical thing. I started by talking about how I see qualities in my father and his handwriting. I think it's somewhat undeniable that we see subjective things in that. Um, but regardless, what it also does is, you know, I, I unearthed these examples of handwriting of, of celebrities and famous people that I was just kind of really interested to see. Does anybody know whose handwriting this is? Have you seen this before? Not anyone who works for me. <laughs> this is Massimo Vignelli's handwriting. And I found this fascinating because everything we know about Massimo Vignelli is just sort of his minimalistic sort of very... Um, you know, bold and graphic style that's very clean and simple. And his handwriting to me made him seem like a real human being, which obviously he was. But I just was fascinated. Like there's so much kind of decor and like movement and it's rhythmic and it's methodical for sure, but it is very kind of lively in a way that made me think about him a little bit differently. And I thought that was really interesting. And again, this is subjective, but I found that was interesting. This is another example. Um, Rochester Institute has an amazing archive of the Vignelli um, kind of working documents and examples, and there's all these process documents that are just incredible. 
This is the handwriting of David Foster Wallace, which I also found fascinating because as somebody that we know as one of the greatest writers of our time, he was also quite troubled. And so we know this. So again, all this kind of subjective information is being infused onto this handwriting, but it's very, it, I don't know, there's a nature to it. There's like a kind of a, I don't know, an emotional kind of um, frustration in it that is so interesting and beautiful to see. And I love the stickers too. Like, so again, a beautiful archive of a lot of his handwriting. Einstein has a lot of handwriting out there that's really fun to see and people kind of really obsess over it and um, how I found this amazing quote that his rhythm is continuous, his letters are both disciplined and playful, his line spacing is very accurate, like he used a ruled paper to keep it all in order. He was a thinker outside of mainstream physics and this was also reflected in his style of writing. Um, Harold Geisler and Elizabeth Waterhouse created a font um, based on Einstein's writing. There's some really beautiful quotes in here. So this is using that font. I found there's um, reviews of the typeface. My favorite is, imagine reading Tinder messages seemingly handwritten by Albert Einstein himself. <laughs> Hilarious. Um, and Fasco had a great quote, even the dumbest articles look smarter when they're printed in the handwriting of the 21st century's most iconic genius. Um, there are also entire organizations and corporations dedicated to handwriting research, and this is like a 10-page dossier about the qualities and personality traits of Einstein just from his handwriting. Let's not go through that. Okay, um, let's move on to another celebrity. Does anybody know whose handwriting this is? <laughs> yep, okay. So this is where I started to look at like what graphology tells us about people's handwriting and there was lots of things analyzed. He's made his handwriting kind of public through these interesting letters he sends to people he has trouble with. Um, and large letters indicate that you are outgoing and love a lot of attention, but it can also mean that you're pretending to have a lot of confidence. Narrow spacing indicates people who can't stand to be alone. They tend to crowd or be intrusive. Writing with pointed letters indicates a writer who's aggressive, intense, intelligent, curious. Maybe, okay. Um, so these are some other examples, and this is one of the best <laughs> handwriting fonts ever created by Mark Davis called Tiny Hand, and we really need this in our lives. <clears throat> so again, I'm a skeptic when it comes to handwriting typefaces, but there are instances of it where it's just undeniably amazing. Um, this is also just a fun, funny thing. Apparently, maybe not now with electronic kind of um, medical records keeping, but the way doctors write prescriptions, we all know that doctors have horrible handwriting. And so again, if like your handwriting is a reflection of your soul, we're a little bit in trouble. But um, 7,000 people a year died because of badly written prescriptions. Um, I found this, which was an amazing use of Comic Sans. This is somebody's analysis of like the way that doctors write. Um, pretty funny. <clears throat> and this I just love. <laughs> and so then also there's this kind of whole kind of paradox in this and you know we trained people for centuries or at least a century to write beautifully but then intelligent people and prudent like there's a quote because you rarely find intelligent and prudent men who write neatly like you are kind of given a pass. So there's this double standard anyway. And then um, just looking at, like I took a, an hour one day and just looked through my Instagram to see all the uses of handwriting on social media today and how handwriting is being used to kind of, again, evoke these ideas. And I'm gonna quote another lovely article I found that handwriting can be great for representing brands that are about personal connection or children, such as childcare centers or charities, companies, wanting to stand out for flair and creativity like fashion designers or photographers. Um, it instantly evokes emotion character making great for a scrolling audience that needs to have their attention captured. So these are the things I saw in an hour on my Instagram that had handwriting on them, which I thought was interesting. Some of it was kind of gimmicky. This is actually written by somebody on a, on a notebook, kind of interesting. Um, okay, so I think I'm running out of time, <laughs> but I'm almost done. So again, just going back to the original inspiration for this talk, I mean, to me, this was just really this notebook as a reminder of the power that we have and the gestures that we make, no matter how we make them, and that they carry emotional resonance for us. And, you know, to me, handwriting is literally and figuratively the root of typography. 
And in the case of my father's journals, they resonate with me because I know the person. But the ways in which we have a personal and cultural association with the, with the shapes and patterns of our letter forms and the way that they deliver information to us is really limitless, whether they're printed or digital. And that's the way, to me, that typography is incredible, and that's the root of how it works. Um, so again, just to wrap up, here are examples of like a note my dad left me. Had that been a text message, it would look like this. What's the difference? What am I missing if there is, you know, if this is the way that we communicate with each other? Also, a note like this would become that. Not a little bit less exciting. Um, but we've come up with all these ways to communicate with each other now that we're not handwriting that are kind of filled with kind of emotive possibilities and all of this other kind of layers of our communication that are filling in the gaps. We have FaceTime, we use the shit out of emojis in all of our text messages. These are just examples that I found that I, I love looking at good emoji art online. It's the funniest thing. Um, so what's interesting to me is that this, you know, our generation, who grew up with handwriting is sort of like, you know, this is a, a something that we understand how to read. We read these things in it, but a new generation who's not familiar with it is going to come up with new modes of finding kind of emotional resonance and creating systems that carry that emotional resonance for them into the future. And so maybe there's gonna be like all kinds of impact from just the way that you type your letters. Who knows, we'll see, but it's a kind of a really interesting time. And then of course, we just use GIFs for everything, which helps us with our communication as well. We use GIFs in our office for a lot of emails because they really kind of help to evoke emotions. So to me, this is kind of the new mode of handwriting. And I'm done, thank you. Mm.